Okay. So we started the recording. Today is the first class for our electricity chapter. We are uh, left with two chapters. Uh, electricity <coughs> is a uh, it's actually a, a amalgam of a uh, common chapter of two different topics. One is electric field, and the other one is current electricity. The electric field chapter is actually very small. Uh, I'll tell you what it contains and everything. And the current electricity chapter is quite big. In terms of number questions for the paper two number questions or in the MCQ paper ground question, this chapter is nearly as worthy. I'm using that word worthy as the kinematics or the projectile motion ch chapter. So you might you should expect nearly equal number of questions from electricity chapter. Whereas in my opinion, the content of this electricity chapter is not that big. There are a lot of hefty calculations, but the basic underlying principles are very simple. I'll make it easy for you as best as I can. And if you have questions, we'll take take, take that up as well. So <clears throat> jumping right in. Let me make this big because we're gonna need a lot of space. Okay. <clears throat> Sir, I mouse move cool like it it clearly the health and I keep buffer with sonic. Sir, shop that the chat's on open, sir. All goes down. I said, yes, thank you. Thanks for the feedback. Okay, the first thing we'll, we'll start today is the electric field chapter. So let me just write that name electric field. Electric field, the stuff that we've learned in our Oliver syllabus for static electricity chapter, we're going to need all of those. Let me tell you those stuffs in a quick uh, a quick uh, progress. Uh, like charges repel, opposite charges attract. Objects can be charged in two different ways. They can be charged by friction and they can be also charged by induction. We have to understand the basic idea of earth what do we mean by an earth connection i'll just help you remember an earth connection doesn't essentially mean ground it can mean ground but it doesn't essentially mean ground for any electrical circuit if you have such a large metallic object preferably metallic object that it has so many electrons free electrons available that a little bit of addition or a little bit of subtraction of electrons does not essentially change its potential that is the key word that you have to mention a little bit of addition of electrons or a little bit of subtraction of electrons, removal of electrons does not effectively, that is also another word, does not effectively or you can say does not practically change its potential, which means it always remains at zero potential. That kind of an object can be considered as an earth connection for any, any electrical circuit. For one example is that uh, <laughs> basic cars, uh, <coughs> cars which are which has a chassis made out of uh, metal, uh, aluminium or, or or iron steel, that entire chassis can work as an earth connection for the entire electrical circuit of the whole car. So the way typically a car's whole body works, they don't do all the they don't do two set of wirings for multiple places. What they do, uh, let's say you want to light up an electric bulb with the car with the car circuit. So they will connect the batteries one end to the chassis directly. It is a connection, default connection. And the other end, typically the negative end, that will be drawn to the individual component. Let's say, uh, if I try to show you some example, let's say this is the chassis of a car. And this is the battery. So on the ba battery, we have two ends. Let's say this is the positive end, this is the negative end. What they will do, uh, let me draw the electrical wire by maybe red. They will make a connection directly from the positive end of the battery to the car chassis. <clears throat> so this whole thing is now working as a positive connection body. And let's say you have to now light up a bulb, the headlight, for example. So here is the headlight headlight connection. So what they will do, they'll pull one wire to this lamp and take the other wire and directly connect it to the chassis. So this will this whole thing will work as the ground connection. In this case, which is working basically connected to the positive on the battery. This is what we call the ground connection for the car circuit. So that's that can work as a ground connection. This whole chassis is not essentially connected to the ground, but for the amount of electrical activity that you're gonna have on a car, 
this amount of metal object can very well work as a buffer or as a reservoir of substantial amount of electrons that a little bit of change will not essentially make it charge. So this, this car body will always remain at zero potential. That's why we can call this ground. Ground connection or uh, uh, ground or earth, they basically pretty much mean the same thing. The circuit symbol for a ground connection is like this, three lines, parallel lines, one smaller than the other. This is the circuit connection for ground. And then we have to also remember from our all of the syllabus, the typical figures for electric field lines whenever you have multiple type of charges available. So the most common variations that you would need to remember that how the shape of electric field lines happen whenever you have two charged spheres side by side. Now they might be plus and plus, they might be minus and minus, they can be plus and minus. In some cases, if, if one, one is big plus and then small plus, so how does that shape work? I'm gonna show you those shape from the Google just after a bit. So two circular objects, maybe of equal charges, maybe of DC, unequal charges, maybe of similar charges, maybe of dissimilar charges. So how does the shape, shape of the field line works for that scenario? And the second thing that you have to remember, understand is that if you have one object that is circular, for example, and the other object that is a, a plate or a rod, uh, that is a flat surface. So how would that field line work in between them? You have to understand this. this these are the two variations that we need to learn that how does, how does this field line shapes work? The only important thing, in my opinion, the, uh, I'm using the word only important thing because I understand that understanding the field line is pretty simple because all of us know that field lines always come out of positively charged object and field lines always get into negatively charged object. We all, all know that. The, own one, the one thing that you really need to understand slash remember is that field lines always come out of a surface perpendicular to that surface. Field lines always come out of a surface perpendicular to that surface, which means if you have two one positive and one negative charges like that, you can never have a field line that looks like this. This is wrong. If you have to start a field line over here, let me use a blue color to show you the current version. This field line will come out perpendicular from here and eventually take a curve and eventually enter over here. So that's how it works. <clears throat> I'm gonna pick up more bigger figure. So the at the exit point will have 90 degree tangent. At the entry point will also have 90 degree tangent. So this will always be true. What does this curve line essentially mean or why does it eventually come, become a curve? I'm gonna talk about that after a while. Just a to kage shuno. And the other thing is also over here, for example, if you have a positively charged object over here and maybe an induced negatively charged plate over here, you can never have a field line that looks like this. This is wrong. The current shape of a field line is that it's, it's gonna come out perpendicular to the surface and eventually it's gonna take a curve and enter into the ground at also, also perpendicular. So you will have 90 degree over here. You'll also have a tangential 90 degree uh, sorry, from the from the radius all the from the center all the way to the along the radius line, you will have an entity over here as well. You cannot have a line, elliptic field line that will make angles with the surface. This is wrong. As long as you can remember this part, judging those field lines can prove to be very simple and easy for you. The other new information which you haven't learned in your all of us, the additional information for the elliptic field lines that you have to remember, is that field lines. Uh, group up, I'm going to use that word, group up, or I can write cl clump. They actually never touch each other. That's the proper, that's one of the properties of the, of the field lines. They always repel each other. So I am using the word clump because it means they can, they get squashed at pointy corners or at pointy edge. What I'm trying to mean, Asha. so what does this mean? Let me pull up some figures from the Google so that it can be helpful for us. Stuff to the right. Uh, what did I do? Oh, I leave. So, Google. Uh, electric field lines. So, let's have a look at some of these images. You already understand this image. These are the two individual images that if we have an isolated positive charge in space, using the word isolated positive charge means there are no charged object around this thing at any considerable distance or theoretically this isolated charge is the only charge in the entire universe 
and in the whole everything around is empty so these lines are straight line coming out of the positive charge object and vice versa for the negative charge object so using the word isolated means that it is a single charge which is not being affected by any other charge object induced or actual charge object doesn't matter it is, it is simply not affected by anything the other figure that we have to understand is right over here this is a very nice figure we have all the variations over here we can have a look if you have two positive charges which are unequal to each other, for example, in this case, this is a higher positive charge body. This is a lower positive charge. For example, this one might have a voltage of, let's say, plus 10 volt. This object, I mean, plus 10 volt means with respect to ground. This one has a plus 10 volt. Whenever I say plus 10 volt means with respect to zero volt, this is plus 10 volt. Let's say this one has a voltage of, let's say, two volt. So this one is more charged. It has experienced bigger loss of electrons so it is more positively charged this is less positively charged but they are both both positively charged so they are like charges but they are not of equal magnitude that's the important bit so if you have that thing then in that case you have you'll have more field lines coming out of the stronger charge and fewer field lines coming out of the, out of the uh, smaller charge and as you can see over here that the stronger field is practically overpowering the field lines produced by the smaller charge you can see that the, these field lines uh, would preferably go in this direction, but they could not go in this direction, rather they got curved and had to get aligned with the field lines produced by the bigger charge. So in simple, simpler terms, the field lines coming out of a bigger charge will overpower the field lines coming out of a smaller charge if they are like charges. So this is for positive, positive, if you have negative, negative, exactly same stuff. The only difference over here is the direction. Field lines are coming out of the positive charges, whereas for the negative charges, the field lines are getting in. That's basically it. What if you have unequal uh, opposite charges? If you, actually, let me just take this, take this picture. Can we have a bit, bigger picture for this one? Uh, okay, yeah, this is this, this is the one. Uh, can I I can copy this up and let me paste it. And a bit zoomed in, beautiful. So if we have <laughs> if we have uh, opposite charges of dissimilar amount you can see very much the same thing the one the charge that has a smaller magnitude will be responsible to create fewer field lines for example in this case on the around the positive charge you can see fewer field lines compared to the negative charge so which essentially goes on proof that this is by magnitude a much higher charge amount this is a much smaller charge for example this might as well be minus 10 volt this could be plus 2 volt or something like that and vice versa over here as well so these, these are the common shapes that you have to understand. The, the basic is very simple, that the feelings are taking bend because they repel each other. Uh, and that's how it works, basically. The, uh, and the other information that is important, let's have a look over here. Do, can we find that other information? Okay, uh, this is actually a really beautiful uh, <clears throat> information. A, a, we're gonna need this picture in just a moment. So I'm gonna copy this image and I'm gonna safe keep it in my drawing board so that we can use this image after a while. <clears throat> Oopsie daisies. How can I... Uh, Open image in new tab and then uh, <clears throat> no, 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 no. Um, copy image. Wait, let's say, let me see if I can invert colors for this one, right click. Uh, invert color. Now I have lost all the field lines. This is bad. So if I control Z, control V, I am not seeing the field lines over here. Okay, never mind. Uh, I can actually use uh, this original picture from here. I'll explain it from here. Don't worry, because it's uh, not uh, cooperating. Does anyone know how how can I actually have this have this thing? Uh, web capture is this a uh, thing <clears throat> oh wow i don't have to use snipping tools boom 
Beautiful. Yes, this is precisely what I wanted. So I'm going to need that after a while. Uh, okay, I'll just write these three fill lines around corners. <clears throat> so if we have a look over here, that what actually happens if we have a pointy edge of an object? This is one of the examples for what actually happens. E in this case, it represents elliptic field strength, which is a new quantity that we're going to learn today. I'm going to show you this, show this to you by definition. Uh, but charge object always tends to behave like this. If you have a sharp corner, that corner will always hold a much higher concentration of charge compared to smooth surfaces. And because more concentration of charge would be around here, more field lines will be coming out from this part <clears throat> rather than coming out from the side. One of the most common practical and old use of this property is the lightning spikes. If we have a lightning spike, it better be sharp on the tip. And that sharp tip practically attracts lightning to hit on that point so that it will not hit on your house or on your barn or on your cattle or on your people or on your family or other places. That lightning spike is basically like a, a bait for all the lightning that could happen around a certain area. And if the tip is very sharp, that ensures that the lightning will, it will pretty much hit at this location. So that's, that's what happens. Now, you might wonder, why does that happen? The actual reason why this happens comes from a complicated, uh, it's complicated for your level, uh, for me as well, because I didn't learn this, but it comes from a complicated explanation using Gaussian surface. Gaussian surface is basically a discussion about how uh, charge fields produces equipotential layers. So it's a uh, three-dimensional uh, structure of, uh, of equipotential surfaces. So that discussion, along with some other calculation, actually we get to this uh, derivation. Uh, you don't need to know who the why part for your syllabus, but you should know the what part that how does it look or what or what what does it look like? Uh, you should need to know the shape of the figure. So I'm not getting into details, but if you're interested, you can look it up in Google. Uh, the the word is Gaussian surface. Uh, finance and corners explanation. So if you just go do this and go over here, you'll have a pretty, some of the very good uh, explanations over here. You can look at this on your own time if you're interested, but it's not necessary for a syllabus that's I'm highlighting more right over here. So these are the shapes that is important for you. And now the new part, new, new thing that we're gonna learn for our A syllabus is that is the new quantity, which is called electric field strength. Let me thickness, it's called electric field strength. This is written as E. It is given by force experienced by a charge within an electric field, of course, that is F divided by the value of that charge or the magnitude of that charge given by a value of Q. So if I just write this equation in terms of, uh, in terms of the variables, I can write E equals to F by Q. So you can see that F is a vector quantity, Q is a scalar quantity. So the division of these two things should also be a vector quantity. So just so that you can remember it well, I can give bar signs over here, which will help you to understand that electric field strength is also a vector quantity. Pretty much similar like if you think about it, let's say F equals to MA. So in this case, if you subject A, you're gonna get F by M. Force is a vector quantity, mass is a scalar quantity. So that definitely tells us acceleration must also be a, def a vector quantity. Pretty similar stuff. <clears throat> Force, uh, this is one thing. And the unit for electric field strength is Newton per Coulomb. Interestingly, this can be also written in volts per meter. Uh, why can it be written in volts per meter? That explanation comes through integration, which you don't have to learn for your all of the syllabus. So I'm not gonna show you that derivation. Just, but, but to convince you that this can also be volts per meter, I'm gonna go through some unit conversion. And this unit conversion that I'm about to show you is important for your syllabus. Sometimes it actually does show up on the exam that show that, that Newton per Coulomb and volts per meter, they're both same quantity. So it sometimes show up in the exam. So I'm gonna show you, show that to you so that it can make sense. So if I write volts per meter, uh, try to remember, what is volt is the unit of uh, voltage by definition voltage is given by what voltage is given by 
joule per coulomb or it is given by uh, joule means uh, work done energy oh, sorry v sorry sorry i shouldn't have done that okay v is given by the definition of voltage w by q so if i tell you the definition that voltage of a certain object it tells us that how much work has to be done to bring unit positive charge from infinite distance to that point is the voltage of that point so work done over charge gives us the definition of voltage so the unit of this one is joule this one is coulomb so i can replace over here volt as joule per coulomb i'm going to keep the parameter over here now we can because we want the per coulomb part so i'm not going to break this apart this is not an SI unit, so logically I could break the Coulomb into ampere second, but I don't want to do that because I am trying to get to this expression where I have Coulomb, per Coulomb, so I'm gonna keep the per Coulomb intact. So let's try to break the Joule. What is the breakdown format for Joule? The definition for work done is given by force multiplied by distance. So that gives us that Joule is given by Newton multiplied by meter. So I'm gonna replace that thing over here. So I'm gonna get Newton, oops. I'm gonna write Newton meter per Coulomb per meter. So meter and per meter crosses out each other. So we only get Newton per Coulomb. This is the basic conversion from Volmir per meter into Newton per Coulomb. This is the easier conversion. Going from Newton per Coulomb to Volt per, uh, volt per meter is basically a redundantly uh, reverse uh, per process. It's usually not asked, but if it is asked, you should know that what are the variables that you need to, that you need to work with. If it, he, he, hear me out. If it is asked that prove that volt per meter and, and neutral per coulomb are same thing, you can basically do that. You convert the volt per meter into neutral per coulomb in these two equal easy steps. So where you have to first apply the this conversion, volt is converting into joule per coulomb, and then you have to convert this one, joule is getting converted into newton meter, and basically that gives you the whole thing. If in any case, the question tells you that now convert newton per coulomb into volt per meter, or show that these two things are equivalent to each other, what I highly recommend that do not try to achieve this the reverse way because this might actually prove to be difficult. What you should do, in my opinion, <coughs> convert this whole thing into its SI base unit and then convert this whole thing into its SI base unit. And then you show that both of these SI base units are same, hence they are the same quantity. This will never fail you unless you are mistaken, but this is a, when a foolproof method. So you can, you should do that. That's my opinion. So that's one conversion thing that I was talking about. So, so let me uh, uh, physically try to explain what does electric field strength is, is. I mean, why is it so important for us? Electric field strength basically tells us that how much how much force will be exerted on each coulomb of charge on a certain electric field. For example, in this case, if you have a look, we have a certain field produced. These black curved lines are a, are the field lines produced by a certain charge. You can see that these arrows are going up outwards. I mean, this is these are going outwards. So you can pretty much assume that right over here we should have a high positive charge, and right over here we should have a small negative charge. You can see that the field lines are actually getting in, and you, you can see that the field line concentration over here is pretty pretty dense, and over here the field line concentration is not so much. I mean, here there are fewer field lines, so I can assume that this is a bigger positive charge. This is a smaller positive, a negative, smaller negative charge. So these two charges is producing a field like this. The significance of the, I mean, why does this line become curved? The reason the lines become curved, for example, let's understand. If we try to understand what would be the resultant force on this charge, on this positive discharge, which is named over here as Q2, what would be the direction of force onto this charge? Should it be in a straight line? Should it be in a straight line? No. This is going to work in both of the straight lines. Let me draw with two different arrows. Let's say this is our center of the positive charge. So if I draw one line up over here, I shouldn't use orange. Uh, blue is also taken. Brown is also taken. Red is the only thing that is not taken. So let's take red. So this is the direction of the repulsive force coming from the positive charge. So I'm going to write this as F plus. Because this Q2 is also a positive charge. This original charge was also positive charge. So they will repel each other. So uh, I have drawn a full straight arrow, but for better understanding, I can actually <coughs> make this thing dot, 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 dot. I have, this is just a reference line. Actual force will start to work from the charge outwards. So this is the repulsive force. 
This is not the only force that's going to work because this is a positively charged object which you have placed in stability field, and this is a negatively charged object. These two things will also attract to each other. So let me let me try and show this attraction by pink. Maybe pink is not taken, so let me just go for the straight line. So that attraction force is going to work along this line, along this line. Now uh, I do not actually want to use uh, such a big attraction force. So let's say I'm going to finish that attraction force right over here. And just for the sake of convenience, I'm going to rub off this whole thing as dot, 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 dot lines, just to show that I use this dotted line to get the alignment. Now you can see that you have two different forces working on this thing. One is the F plus and this other one I can label as F minus. I'm just using the F plus and minus to show you that which one is the output force, individual force from the positive charge, which one is the individual force from the negative charge. As it so happens, the resultant of these two forces is going to be this force, which is over here. Let me zoom in for those who cannot see this because it's a bit light work. So you can see the F2 over here is the resultant of these two forces. And that F2 will always be tangent with the electric field line. I'll tell you again. The resultant force working on a test charge placed on an on a, on a, on a, on a, on a electric field line will always be, the resultant force will always be tangent with the field line. Or in other words, I can say the field line practically did, uh, tells us, or the field line practically gives us the exact direction of the resultant force experienced by a charge object placed within an electric field. That can be a combined electric field, for example, right over here, the combined electric field, or it can be a single electric field, doesn't matter. But the electric field lines, The electric field lines basically give us the alignment of the resultant force of this thing. Now there is a small catch. The catch is, you can. I want all of you to have a very good look at the difference of F2E2 and F3E3. Take a good look. Here F2 is working in this direction. Here F3 is working in this direction. But you can see that E1 is E2 is working this way. E3 is working this way. You might wonder why. What is that? Here's the deal. Elliptic field strength, for the sake of universal non-confusion, elliptic field strength is defined like this. Uh, let me show you the definition from the PDF. Maybe that would be a bit easier. Have a look. Force per unit charge at any point is the elliptic field strength in the uh, elliptic field strength at, of that point. Uh, positive word force per unit positive charge. Please do write this. I'm gonna do the correction in my PDF. Let me zoom in. Why can't I zoom this? Positive kotha I can leak now. I mean, here, what they say? Oh, you got all the phone should have got the phone journey with the other hair. Phone to chill it out of the chair. No. Baro, okay. And it's right to borrow for the way. My borrow. Oh, you can also make a change with that scenario. to put an arrow over here. Do we have arrows over here? Uh, insert. I'm sorry for that background noise. That is my kid. She makes a lot of weird and nice sounds. How is she, sir? 
She's small. Is she fine? Yeah, yeah, she's fine, uh, but she's small. Okay, I can be positive taken in here. I'm an arrow dodge hamela, but I get the positive leak now. I'm uh, let me ex explain that. Why do we have to go for the positive thing? Charges are of two types positive charges, negative charges. We all know this thing to avoid universal confusion and to have a streamlined way of understanding across all the scientists and the researchers and all the uh, all the people uh, working with charges the definitions of all electrical quantities which are relevant with a, a, a charge particle we have used positive charges let me tell you what what does this mean the Definition of electric field strength actually goes like this. The force per unit positive charge at any point in the electric field is the electric field strength of that point. It means if you bring Q positive charge, as you can see in this figure, we have actually shown the plus Q, but I forgot to write this word over here, my bad. I'm sure I, I missed out to write this, not the story, it's not the true students fault, it's definitely my fault. So you can see that if we place a plus Q charge right over here, that plus Q charge is going to experience a force along the direction of the field lines, and that direction is the F. So how much charge, how much force will be experienced by unit charge or one Coulomb charge? That is basically what is represented by electric field strength. Or in other words, you can understand that electric field strength, this is sort of like a measure that force per unit charge. So if you bring bigger force, you're going to get bigger. Uh, if you get a, bring a bigger charge particle, you're going to get a bigger force. If you bring a smaller charge particle, you're going to get a smaller force. Because by definition, electric field strength is defined as a positive charge. That's why electric field strength will always be directed. Electric field strength will always be directed in the direction of the field lines. Because these field lines will always travel from positive to negative. Here, that's why you can see over here, E2 is aimed away from the positive charge. E3 is also aimed away from the positive charge. However, the reason F3 is aimed the other way around because Q3 is a positive charge. Q3 is a negative charge. If Q3 was positive, then E3 and F3 would be same. Because Q3 is a negative charge, which means in this case, this charge particle will do the attraction towards it. So we're gonna have an attraction like this. And this charge particle will make a repulsion like this. And this attraction and repulsion together will produce this resultant force. So if it's a positive charge, the direction of electric field strength and the force are same, tangent to the curve. If it's a negative charge, the direction of electric field strength and force are exactly opposite to each, other, to each other, still tangent to the curve. Any questions so far? Or if you want me to read Sir, E2 or E3, E2 and E3 represents the electric field strength of this exact location, electric field strength of this exact location. Okay, sir. You don't, uh, okay, one more thing is important that you don't assume that E2, uh, the electric field strength are only possible on the uh, electric field. You have to understand that electric field is actually imaginary lines. It is very much possible for us to have other uh, charge particle present and we can also have electric field over here. Electric field is available at every single point. Just for the sake of easy understanding, they have shown this charge particle labeled on the electric field line so that we can understand the tangent behavior clearly. But it's not essential that these are the only alignments where electric field is here. No, electric field line is available everywhere around this thing. We're just using some of these lines to represent its orientation and its existence. It is everywhere. Bujha Gaseki so far? Sir, last part tick to over Bujha Ben. Direction a Jagata. A direction a Jagata? G, sir. Mano opposite can. Negative charge. I mean, the I I hope. Uh, back. Uh, Let's say, let me show you this thing. If you consider the scenario for this one, uh, here we have a positron, and here we have an electrode 
कष्ट डेफिनेशन Electric field strength is given by the force experienced by a unit positive charge. So, by definition, electric field strength is given by, is defined for positive charge behavior. That's why the duration of the electric force and the duration of the electric field strength are always be equal, always going to be same if the charge that you are handling is positive. So, in this case, this is a positive charge object. So, E two and F two they are in the same alignment. This was a, a positive charge object, but this is closer. To the field, so or you can see that this one is at a much denser field compared to this one. That's why over here, electric field strength is stronger and electric for force is also stronger. But if this charged particle or considered charged particle is negatively charged, negatively charged particle will have ne the negatively charged particle will experience force in the opposite direction of the arrowhead because the arrowheads represent the uh, force direction uh, uh, for the positive charges. Tangent of the uh, curve uh, of the of the electric field lines it represents the force direction for positive charges. So if you have a negative charge, you're simply going to have reversed. The force that earlier used to be attractive now is going to become uh, repulsive, and the one that was repulsive is now is going to become attractive. So that's why the force is having a re re uh, having a uh, uh, reverse. Uh, it is working tangent and backwards, but the electric field strength is still working in the forward direction because electric field strength by definition is defined for positively charged. particles so if we place the positive charged particles over here then that force would go in this way but because it is a negative charged particle is going to go exactly the other way around that's the main difference ji sir bhi se chhe beautiful beautiful and closer particles are going to experience a much stronger electric field strength hence a bigger force and further particles are going to experience a much weaker electric field strength and a much weaker force so that goes without saying you know this thing that closer field and have stronger field and vice versa ब्राउन You might wonder they are not parallel, but they are going to become parallel, just like that. If we have two parallel plates, and the potential difference between these two parallel plate is V. So if you connect a voltmeter, let's say the voltmeter gives you reading of V, and if these two plates are d distance apart. You have to remember these are parallel plates. They are apart by a fixed distance, and they have a voltage across this thing. Let's say, for the sake of explanation, let us assume that this is the higher positive uh, voltage, and this is the uh, negative voltage. And for the sake of understanding, let's assume they are equal. What happens in this case? The field lines are going to tra travel vertically downwards. You already know this thing from your Euler's part. In this case. I mean, 
for for this field for this scenario the electric field in between the two plates you have to understand that i'm using the term plate although these things are shown as lines you have to assume that these are the side view of a rectangular plate and this is also the side view of a rectangular plate so in between these two rectangular plates there is practically a cuboid shaped space there is a cuboid shaped space and that is very important for us to understand that within the, this whole space the spacing of two field lines is going to be exactly same you are not going to have any variation anywhere if you have the same density of electric field lines <coughs> that practically means same electric field strength which brings us to the idea that inside the inside two parallel parallel uh, plates uh, carrying charge the electric field strength within that those two parallel lines will be same everywhere which means <coughs> so you're going to have a difference over here same will difference over here same difference over here it would not matter whether you are close to one of the positive charge power plate or you are close to negative charge power plate it, it would not matter because the fields are all parallel which means they have the same unity field strength value all over the space in between the two blocks one more interesting way to understand this thing that this is not the case for single charge particle for example if we have a positive charge particle and if i try to draw the uh, field field lines let's say i'm going to only draw maybe eight of them okay let's say why it's we have drawn eight field lines you have to understand that if you consider location over here and assume a circle drawn with the with the same radius you will understand that the gap between consecutive field lines is very small compared to if you go ahead and draw uh, a field line behavior right over here in this case the gap between two field lines is actually very really small that small gap makes is what makes the field weaker as you get further away from an individual single charge as the field lines uh, keep on uh, increase in, in their gaps you will have frozen uh, <coughs> sorry you, you uh, so as the, uh, kibol silam acha ha as long as we have so, uh, when a single charge particle where you have the field lines not parallel to each other but rather they are radial this is the ratio that we call radial for positive charge it should be radially outwards for negative charges it should be radially inwards but for those cases we can have different e value at different locations the further we go the weaker the field becomes and vice versa however that is not logical to attempt uh, in the in in this part in which part uh, in this part because here the field lines are really close to each other the def the equation that gives the electric field strength within this field is given by uh, v equals to na v equals to na my bad bhul likhi so the electric field strength e equals to v d by d electric field strength is given by voltage over distance but khub important jinish khyal korte hobe ei je e equals to uh, or energy equals to v into d ei question ta ei je ekhane je amader the gaps that we have equal over here uh, so we're going to have this expression over here which is going to give us newton per coulomb and that's pretty much it for the electric field strength orientation so etu ho chhe ekta part ar ekta part থার্ড যে পার্টটা আমাদের ইলেকট্রিক এই আমাদের এই এই সিলেবাসের পেপার আছে এই সিলেবাস পেপার মানে হচ্ছে দিস ইজ দা কোনটা আ দাও দুটো প্রপার্টি বলছি তিন নাম্বার তিন এ থ্রি লিখলাম কেন দোকানে আমি কি বলতেছি হ্যাঁ আমি আমি হাবিয়ে বলতেছি আই এম সরি আমি লাস্ট কত বন্ধু বলছি বুঝা গেছে আই ওয়াজ এ বিট মিসলিডেড না স্যার ঠিক আছে না আমি লাস্ট কত বন্ধু বুঝা গেছে আমাকে একটু ধরা দাও তো কত বন্ধু এক্সপ্লেইন করেছেন যেটা 
ফর্মুলাভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভলিভল
this. And the way we define this behavior is that everywhere the acceleration is minus g. For all the parts is minus g because it is continuously working on the object. That's why it's gonna speed up vertically downwards. The same thing is uh, is what I'm trying to show you over here uh, or tell you over here is that as the electron enters into the field, it's gonna start experiencing uh, acceleration in the same direction. This figure is not essentially very accurate. The bending should start exactly from the left. At the entry point, the bending should start and slowly it should curve outwards, uh, up, uh, outwards in this case. If I did not write an uh, electron over here, if I did write an alpha particle, what is an alpha particle? Do, does anyone remember what is an alpha particle? Helium. Yes, sir. Helium nucleus, exactly. So, um, uh, so if we if we do if we shot an alpha nucleus within this field within this exact same field, that that alpha, alpha particle is gonna be, be gonna be bending downwards. So, what you have to understand that in which direction is gonna bend, and that bending motion follows a constant acceleration in the same direction, pretty much like gravitational acceleration. Irrespective of object's motion, the gravitational force always works vertically downwards. Simple always works vertically downwards. So this is the important bit. Let's see how Don't worry about that. But can I make a parabolic motion about the projectile motion of the Kanansi? A reason into Bushaga Sekina because they both have the same type of motion that is uh, uh, what me, which it means that it is a it is a uh, key motion body in it again. But a parabolic path motion as a figure of the Bulta says it's a acceleration gurias and I will like the making the issue of The curving of the path actually starts from the very entry point of this object. Let me just show you one figure over here. Electron entering and uh, entering uh, uh. age, age, so throughout the motion, I'm under the academic issue. That's why we're waiting for further questions. Okay. 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 Find out the final velocity of the electron as it leaves out of the plug, which is a really large plug. Or they might also ask us that uh, de de determine or, or determine uh, with logical or logical assumption about your uh, we can sorry use the same equation, same set of equation uh, to calculate out the Positive behavior, for example, instant velocity after t goes to 0 0.2 second, or or the alignment or the orientation of this thing. So the orientation of the object means that as the electron will uh, electron or other charge particle will enter the field, they will bend, and that bend will be starting from the instant it is start it starts to experience this figure. So, the, I mean, the reason I'm telling you so many so many stuff, you don't have to. Uh, be bothered by this the whole thing is that this acceleration arrow should start from the very beginning that's the point i'm trying to highlight it's just never going to be something like that that it goes in a straight line halfway through the play field and only then it starts to carve outwards no it's not like that the other type of question that we're going to find out is that we're going to be given all the necessary data to do the calculation and the question is going to be pretty simple that as this charge particle enters within this electric field with a certain velocity they were going to definitely going to provide those numbers is it safe no, no, not, not safe. So is it possible that the electron comes out of the electric field or uh, is it gonna hit one of the plates? They're gonna use that word, one of the plates. So uh, they are not, uh, so that's what they did for my share. <coughs> so uh, this is important. That is it gonna come out or is it gonna uh, get, hit one of the plates of the uh, golden, uh, of, the, of the electric field uh, making uh, structure. So 
এই দুইটা এ হচ্ছে আমাদের কি পার্ট এটা রিলেভেন্ট আর কিছু ম্যাথস আছে বাট ম্যাথসগুলো আমি তোমাদেরকে আজকে দেখাবো ম্যাথসগুলো আমি তোমাদেরকে নেক্সট ক্লাসে দেখাবো বাট এই পর্যন্ত থিওরি এই ডিসকাশন পর্যন্ত প্রপারলি বোঝা গেছে কিনা স্যার আলফা পার্টিকেলস তো আমরা বলে না যে 90 ডিগ্রি বেন্ড করে লাইক ডেভিয়েট করে ওইটার সময় কি হয় তাহলে ও হল অফ হল আলফা পার্টিকেল 90 ডিগ্রি ডেভিয়েট করে হচ্ছে ভেরি ফিউ আলফা পার্টিকেলস বেন্ড উইথ অ্যান অ্যাঙ্গেল মোর দ্যান 90 ডিগ্রি ইন দা গোল ফয়েল এক্সপেরিমেন্ট we have a very thin gold foil where we have a thickness of about uh, uh, 3 to 5 gold atoms and then we're going to shot alpha particles that's a radioactive experiment here we are shooting an alpha particle within an electric field and it's going to undergo some curving because of the charge interaction <coughs> okay sir মানে তুমি যে एग्जांपलটা বলতেছো ওখানে আমাদের আলফা পার্টিকেল আছে বাট ওখানকার আইডিয়াটা হচ্ছে যে আমাদের উই হ্যাড এ ভেরি থিন গোল ফয়েল অর এ ভেরি থিন গোল মেশিট এন্ড উই শট আলফা পার্টিকেলস টু দ্যাট থিং টু फाइंड आउट फिगर आउट द स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ एन एटम বাট হিয়ার উই আর নট শুটিং एनीथिंग থ্রু এ গোল ফয়েল উই আর বেসিক্যালি শুটিং আলফা পার্টিকেলস উইদিন এন ইলেকট্রিক ফিল্ড উইথ হুইচ ইজ এ হুইচ ইজ এ চার্জ অফ 4 হুইচ ইজ এ চার্জ অফ প্লাস 2e এন্ড ইট হ্যাজ এ আর এটা জানো কি নাম্বার বলে এই তো এটাই and masters ja lagbe eigulo shomonder dao thakbe na sir oi je amader ekta mcq chilo na je erokom ekta electric ya field diye apni gamma ray hocche ke ya korchen radiate korchen tarpor hocche ke beta particles korchen na alpha particles korchen onder direction kon dike kon ta jabe he there is there is a definite free figure for this yeah this is a very big 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 beautiful question let me show you this thing Alpha particle is gonna bend. Okay, this is the this is the type of bending that we're gonna have for uh, for uh, magnetic field lines. So in this figure, the curved lines are all circulars. But if we have an elliptic field, you're gonna have a situation like this. Here, here have a look. So if you are shooting these particles, alpha particle is going to bend less, but towards the negative plate, away from the positive plate. Beta particle is going to take a really sharp turn because they are very light, so uh, they accelerate very, very much. So they have undergo very uh, in a curved path, accelerate much. In this case, mean that they are going to undergo a much bigger amount of direction change within a very short amount of time. So that's basically velocity change, and gamma simply doesn't bend at all. This is the figure that you asked for. क्वेश्चन <coughs> I mean, preferably write them in the group chat so that everyone can have a look and other people can benefit from it as well. Okay, it to gallo. I'm gonna take a five minutes break. I'm gonna have a wash uh, so that I do not blabber more, and then I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna pause the recording. You kids can also take five. So after break, we are <coughs> resuming the class. The next thing that I would like to jump in is what we have for the current city chapter. <coughs> First thing first, we cannot forget anything and everything that we have learned in our O-level syllabus. I hope you remember most of the stuffs. Just for a quick catch up, I'm gonna go through some of the stuffs which will be required very highly for our uh, upcoming lecture. So I'm gonna show you some stuff so that it it helps us. So I'm gonna uh, get rid of these figures and start current electricity. Current electricity is something that we call sometimes you can also call it DC uh, direct current because they both pretty much stand for the same thing. <clears throat> we don't have AC in our all of the syllabus, so we don't have to bother about that. AC will show up in our in, uh, A two inshallah. So let me just name. We are doing. Why is this thing not okay? current electricity 
or you could see it's just DC. <clears throat> first thing first, the common resistance in a series circuit is given by the sum of all the resistances, R1 plus R2 plus R3 dot 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 dot. The common resistance for a parallel combination is goes by inverses. So R1 inverse one plus R2 inverse one plus R3 inverse one plus dot 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 dot, dot whole inverse. <clears throat> you know how this works. I like this format better because it is easier to uh, put in the calculator. So less possibility of error. The typical version that comes up in the in the books for this formula looks like this: that one by R P equals to one by R1 plus one by R2 plus one by R3 <coughs> plus dot, 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 dot. It is a typical formula. I like this. This is also perfectly good. I like this format better uh, less because what happens in many cases, students do this whole sum, but to get the final RP value, they have to once again reverse the whole thing. Sometimes they forget that thing. But in a calculator, if you start with a bracket and do all this stuff and immediately forget to put this thing, it, uh, then your calculator will say syntax error. Then you'll remember, okay, I forgot this minus one. So you have a bit of a proof uh, cross-checking so that you are going to have to close that bracket and give this uh, uh, final minus one so that you will all directly get this number out of your calculation. So this is, a, in my opinion, is a bit more foolproof method. But both of them are perfectly good. The next thing we have to remember is Ohm's law. Ohm's law is V equals to IR, applicable for at a constant temperature. V is the voltage across the conductor. R is the resistance of the conductor. I is the current flowing through the conductor. The other thing that you would understand that if in this equation, any there are three variables over here. So if we make one of these variables to be constant, the other two variables will be related like that. So if, if for a constant voltage connection, we can say current is inversely proportional to resistance. For a constant current flow, we can say voltage directly proportional to resistance, or for a constant resistance, we can say voltage directly proportional to current. So we can have these three proportionalities, provided the third variable is constant. So these are pretty basic stuff, no big deal. Then we have to remember that uh, the IV graph for <coughs> the IV graph for a uh, for a ohmic conductor or for an ideal conductor, or which does not uh, changes resistance on temperature is a straight line that goes to the origin. This is the uh, IV graph for an ohmic conductor. If we have a metal, metals tend to have a shape like this. <coughs> metals, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as more current flows through a metal, it tends to uh, get heat up and that heating uh, causes more, uh, more physical friction between the flowing electrons with the lattice ions, which ultimately results in a higher resistance. That's why we lose a bit of a gradient. And for semiconductor materials, or you can say transistor materials, we have the IV graph to be a bit more like this, because once again, for the semiconductor materials, the actual conductivity is very low. But whenever it gets a little bit of heat up because of the current flow, more electrons <coughs> move from the valence shell into the conduction shell. Now, do you guys know what these things are? <coughs> Anyone? Valence shell and conduction shell. So, valence shell and conduction shell, this concept of valence shell and conduction shell is a bit new for us. I'm going to explain this to you. Don't, don't worry. But the bottom line is that for semiconductor materials, uh, as <coughs> higher current starts to flow through the conductor, the heating effect of, the con of that material liberates more free electrons <coughs> within the lattice. So bigger number of electrons allows for bigger amount of current flow. That's why we have an apparent decrease of resistance. That's why the gradient of IV graph goes higher. These are the very core things that you have already known from your syllabus. One thing you have to understand additional to this part is that the graph for a diode, this is new. This was from all of us. The graph for a diode has a shape like this. <laughs> the idea of diode actually works by uh, what, you, what you call uh, what you call a depletion layer. I'm going to show you some animation of this thing to you for a better understanding. Uh, why do we have uh, current? Bias to... the... <laughs> yeah. Yes. Reverse bias of the flow curve. Okay, so... <laughs> reverse bias of flow curve. Yeah. Both say. Reverse bias of flow curve. Actually, to be honest, I should give a break sign over here. Reverse bias of flow curve. Basically, idea is if we apply. Uh, reverse bias within a diode and keep on increasing that reverse voltage. 
there exists a certain value of voltage at which the diode will lose its capability to prohibit or restrict that current and in that case the diode will be overrun or in other terms i can say that the diode will become electrically destroyed the rush of the electrons or the pressure of the electron flow slash voltage would be it can become so high that the diode no longer can uh, oppose that so <clears throat> that there is a certain voltage value uh, for which there would be a sudden increase in the reverse current this is basically where the diode becomes dysfunctional that's it are we break the key uh, I, I used a break over here, for example, uh, for silicon materials, the value of this part <coughs> for which in the forward bias, the voltage, I mean, you are applying voltage, but the current is not happening. But beyond a certain point, the current starts to become a, a straight line, positive gradient. For silicon, this value is about 0 0.7 volt. <coughs> if you have a silicon wafer, then you have to apply a minimum of 0 0.7 volt to make the silicon material to behave like a conductor below 0 0.7 volt of voltage <clears throat> no electron would have enough energy to become free enough from the lattice to become freely moving <coughs> to free up some electron to for it to make for it to become conductive we have to apply a minimum voltage of 0 0.7 volt across silicon for germanium this value is 0 0.3 volt so germanium can work at a much smaller voltage so uh, in many cases, if you want to work really high efficiency or low voltage circuits, sometimes germanium is also used. But then again, germanium has a pretty small value. So sometimes it is very close to zero. So that can lead to some short circuit as well. So if we use germanium for a circuit, uh, we have to design the circuit to be very sensitive. And it can give us very sensitive results as well. But you cannot be robust with it. But for a silicon cir circuit, you can be somewhat robust with it. No big deal. Yes, sir. <coughs> so, so, this is the animation. Don't worry about that. 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 Don't worry about among these three expressions, this is the most commonly used expression because here R is kept as a constant. So the higher current will flow through a conductor, <coughs> typically more power it will consume. So A2 portion of the Olivers to take the Monaraka like the basic camera J series circuit among the basic calculation procedure for series circuit or parallel circuit that we have learned. We shouldn't forget those. <coughs> One more thing that I'd like to show you. Uh, which is essentially a part of our old syllabus, but I want you to remember this. <clears throat> what do we mean by equivalent points? Let me just draw a circuit pretty quick. Let's say we have a battery and we have some voltages over here. Sorry, resistors over here. <clears throat> and maybe uh, I, I'm going to give another branch. Which gets connected over here. <coughs> no. Don't <laughs> they <laughs> That is pretty correct. I was more going for this. So it is a show by What a busy got it. Never mind.
So what I'm going to show you over here, the idea of equivalent points. I equivalent point idea is simple. If I place an emitter over here, an emitter over here, these two emitters will definitely give me the same reading. If I place another emitter right over here, that should give me the same reading as well because all of these things are working the same way. But that will not be true if I place another emitter over here. Let me draw that with maybe light green. These two emitters will give me different readings. <coughs> You have to understand that. And if you're trying to measure voltage across different points of the circuit, you kids do know up till now that if you know the value of the source, if you know the value of all of these resistors, and if I connect a voltmeter, let's say across uh, these, two vol these two resistors, you can calculate how much voltage is over here. You know how to do this because there's a series combination. You can simply find out that how much voltage would be here. <clears throat> what you have to learn for your AS syllabus, new thing, is that what if we connect a voltmeter from here to here? What is gonna be the reading of this voltage connection? Doesn't that look a bit weird? Or maybe what will be the voltage connection from here through here? So if I connect a voltmeter like this, what will be the reading of this voltmeter? So these are the new connections we're gonna see. I'll help you understand this. These are pretty interesting and easy stuff, but you have to really understand the working procedure for these stuff. So I am just, I was just trying to give you, give you a glimpse what is uh, one of the new things that we were gonna learn for uh, this part. And <clears throat> the first, Asha, before I actually get into this whole uh, circuit combination, I would like to talk a little bit more about this thing. I'd like to get this out of my hand. Uh, so first thing I'm gonna take, do you have the textbook? Anyone? Yes, sir. Boye, the hotel Sir, ki dekbo? Conduction band, valence band. Pisces, <clears throat> please go to page number We can figure that thick down. I we are to take the ass of Che AJ guy. AJ, I can figure that thick the ass. Acha, I mean, if you get a deal, Bushai, the if you get a key bulla say, money AJ, don't the boy figure a key bulta say, she doesn't have to balance the other. Actually, bulla money. Acha, let me just tell you what, what, what is this thing from, from this, uh, from the micro notebook. <clears throat> you kids know that uh, electrons exist within a certain uh, atom in shells, <clears throat> which are the allowed energy values of the electrons around some determined or specific orbits within which an electron can exist. 
electrons cannot exist any space in between two orbits. And within orbits, we also have orbitals. You kids might have come across these orbitals, S, P, D, F, and stuffs. Do you know these things? Yes, sir. All of you. Shabaki chemistry, that's it. G, sir. Okay, that's the yes. So, electrons within within in, within one shell. Let's say, uh, if consider, let's say, uh, let's consider silicon. Silicon silicon has a uh, atomic number of fourteen, so it is two eight four. So this third shell layer has four electrons within it, and these four electrons. <coughs> can have different values of energies. They will have a certain range of energy and that range of energy will tell us what is the total value of the third shell. But each individual electron of these four electrons can have different values of energy. Based upon how much energy they have, that outer shell layer of silicon can be divided, can be divided into two key parts, two key parts. Uh, let me draw, uh, it would may, I, I think I can make it better understandable. Let's say this entire rectangle represents the third shell of a silicon uh, atom. Now you might wonder rectangle, how? What I'm trying to show you, uh, it's not essentially rectangle, let's say uh, this is an axis, this is an axis of energy within this energy axis. This is the highest energetic electron that can exist within the thir third shell. This is the lowest energetic electron that can exist within the third shell. Let's say these are the possible energy values of all the electrons that could possibly exist within the third shell. So you might wonder that oh, then where is the second shell? Well, logically speaking, second shell might start from here. So there is a gap over here, which distincts the, uh, which the differentiates third shell from second shell. So the second shell might have a different energy band right over here. So this is the part where the electrons cannot exist. If electrons either have to have some energy within this rectangle or they have to have some energies within this rectangle. Does this idea make sense? Using the rectangle- Sir, Pujini. Using the rectangles, I'm trying to show you different energy values. Achha, let me show you, let's say, just assuming numbers, let's say this energy is 30 Joule, this energy is let's say uh, 25 Joule, okay, whereas, this energy, the top value of the second shell, let's say that is 18 Joule, and maybe the very bottom value of the second shell is, let's say, uh, 12 Joule. So what I'm trying to show you is that any electron which has, an, which has an individual energy value within this range will belong to shell number two. Any electron which has an energy between 25 Joule to 30, 30 Joule will belong to shell number three. But no electron can have an energy between 18 and 25. Okay, sir. Sir, why is it a rectangle and not just a line? Uh, we could simply use a single line. Uh, a rectangle, I honestly don't have an answer for this. We could have simply used a line, but I think the purpose for rectangle is that uh, I'm gonna use different, uh, different rectangles over here and show you some overlaps over as well. Using a single line, that might be a bit difficult to understand. I think so. But let me just go ahead. I mean, this will become more clear, I hope. But I honestly don't have an answer why rectangle. I mean, why not any other shape? Uh, the scientists decided it to be rectangle. I, I really don't know why they chose rectangle. But I believe that the rectangle makes it easier to explain for the later parts. So let's have a look. Now, interesting thing happens for all the shells, but we're going to very much highlight on the outer shell layer because this is basically where all the stuff's happening. Chemical reaction, electricity conduction, they are all responsible for the behavior of uh, outer shell electron. So this is the part that we are very interested in. The electrons on the outer shell layer can have a subdivision of their energy values. There can be two subdivisions. One subdivision is what we call the conduction band, which is a bit higher energy level. And the other subdivision can be called to be valence band which is a bit lower energy value. Let me tell you what is what does this mean? The electrons, let's say, let's say I'm gonna, I'm actually zooming in this whole, this whole thing. Uh, I mean, I, I'm actually zooming this whole thing. And this is what I'm trying to show you. I'll, I'll explain. 
electrons which has an energy over here they can take part into chemical reaction electrons which have a, i mean will electrons which have an energy value over here they can take part into electrical conductive conductivity valence electrons cannot take part in electrical conductivity because you have to understand for an electron to become conducting electron it has to become delocalized or in other terms it has to <coughs> get rid of the attraction of a single atom and become a property of the whole block whole block the basic idea of metallic bonds when that happens then the electron is at a such high energy state that it is <coughs> not essentially attached to a single atom hence it can take part into electricity conduction it can do that <coughs> so bottom line electrons which has an energy of the valence band equivalency they can take a part in chemical reaction but not conductivity electrons which are only in the <coughs> sorry this is saying i have to electrons which belong to the conduction band they can take part into electricity conduction uh now interesting thing happens for three type of material so i'm going to copy paste this whole thing and help you understand within metals these two things overlap and they overlap by quite a big amount which means whenever these two things overlap so what are we having electrons which are uh, over here they will be only conducting electrons which are over here they will be only reacting however electrons which are in this region sweet spot common spot they could be conducting or they can be reacting as well because these two layers overlap i mean the required energy level to energy to become conducting and the required energy to become reacting reaction of valence by valence electrons they because they overlap all pretty much all metals are good conductors of electricity all of their most of the valence electrons can take part into electricity conduction so they have good conductivity altogether what happens for non metals or poor conductors for example sulfur uh graph uh, diamond wood glass you name it the conduction band and the valence band has a very large energy gap between them so i should not have placed control <clears throat> they have a pretty, pretty large energy gap you have to understand that whenever i am making them spread you have to understand that still this whole thing belongs to the outer shell layer but within this outer shell layer there are two subdivision of energy values this is the energy value that represents the valence band and this is the energy amount that represents the conduction band which means if this material for which this drawing is done on the y axis we have the energy value of individual electrons if this material has to become conductive some of this valence electron have to overcome this huge gap of energy and belong to this value if that is possible to achieve this material will become conductive now yes we get why um valence valence electrons cannot be conducting electrons because they don't have enough energy but why can't conducting electrons be valence electrons why can't they react no no conduction electrons can react as well i didn't say that no sir acha my bad conduction electrons can conduct and react both valence electron can only react but cannot conduct okay sir thank you i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i i might have must have slipped my mind sorry thank you thanks for clarifying that so because there is a large energy gap and this is all still within the last uh, final uh, outermost energy layer it is quite unlikely that valence electrons will practically make this jump and become conductive now i'm using the term quite unlikely i'm not saying impossible you might wonder why because like i always say and i always try to make my students understand this that given enough voltage anything can be made into a conductor mark my words given enough voltage 
anything can be made into conductor. The biggest example of this thing is lightning. Lightning happens through thin air. Air. There is not even a con this is not even a continuous medium. <clears throat> Individual gas molecules, water droplets spread around. But when the voltage between the clouds and the ground becomes so high, current can flow through that discontinuous medium. And in that situation, when lightning occurs, the air molecules through which the lightning occurs, in for those air molecules, the valence electrons can have enough energy to jump to this value and then they become conducting electrons. That's why that stream of air molecules become glowing and they conduct electricity for a fraction of a second within which they carry millions of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I'm not sure about million. They carry a huge amount of current and a huge energy is discharged from the cloud towards the ground. So given enough voltage, it is possible, but it's not naturally occurring, <clears throat> not uh, for a regular life. <clears throat> this is for the non-metallic substance. There's a large gap and this gap is what we call the forbidden gap. Forbidden gap means that electrons cannot exist here. What happens for the semiconductor materials, interesting, is that the gap between the valence band and the conduction band, there is a gap, but the gap is quite small. To transfer some electrons from the valence band into the conduction band, you have to apply a small amount of voltage. Like I said, for silicon, that voltage is 0 0.7 volt. For germanium, that voltage is 0 0.3 volt. You apply this much voltage, individual voltage, minimum voltage to these crystals, the electrons will start to have enough energy to jump from the valence band and go to the conduction band and they will start converting electricity. This is why, <coughs> this is why the, uh, the, the uh, semiconductor materials have a graph like this. I mean, the semiconductor materials, if we draw the IV graph shape for semiconductor materials, we always end up shapes like this. Because the higher the temperature goes, that thermal energy makes more vibration. So that makes in, that energy is more electron in the valence band. So more electron can jump into the conduction band. And let's say it's very simple. If you, if, if, if you have two electrons in the conduction band, the amount of current you flow you're gonna get. If you have four, four electrons over here, you're gonna simply gonna get double the current. Double the current necessarily means half the resistance. So that's why this happens. So it is a band theory basic idea. Butchukina. Sir, match kane je yata dakhalen. Cheita kon type of materials ma like matters ke ya kore. Acha. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> so, this is band theory basically. Band theory is the same as the band theory concept. Is the the band theory, band theory the question number is the same as But if you have the concept of this thing, the part that things become much easier to understand. This is also the very first time you are having an actual theoretical and acceptable logical explanation why certain things are conducting and why certain things are non conducting and why certain things are semiconducting. Up so far, as far as I know, for your syllabus, the few syllabus of CIE, up so far, you didn't have any explanation for it. You just knew that certain things are good conductors, certain things are poor conductors, some things, certain things are halfway. But why is it so? Here is an explanation for that why part, first time. Okay. Why diode, diodes have a shape? Like this, why diodes have a shape like this? Acha, to want to get doping assay, syllabus. No, I mean, I'm to see what the honey and bullet is a syllabus. It asking, I'm very much willing to teach this to you. This is really interesting, and I personally feel really uh, awesome to teach this. Uh, but I need to figure out whether it is actually in your syllabus or not. If you get a bull as a baba, if you get a bull as a Ojuna, me, if you get a tape or a name for agony for an amount of different for the island, Tamito, I see. I know for a fact this is correct. 
Und die musst du sehen. Und das ist ja gut. ट्रांसफर So different partial difference volt W group area. Discuss it. Discuss. Hey, just same kind of data. Yes. Sketch and discuss the IV characteristics of a metallic conductor at constant temperature, a semiconductor diode, and a filament lamp. The IV characteristics of a metallic conductor at constant temperature is very simple. That is basically an ohmic conductor which which gives you a straight line because it says constant temperature. If they did not mention constant temperature. Then we would have decreasing gradient for the IV graph, but at a constant, if you can maintain it at a constant temperature, then it will definitely maintain ohmic behavior, which means the more you increase the voltage, the current will also increase proportionally. No big deal. Then comes the semiconductor diode, so you have to discuss and discuss the IV characteristics of semiconductor diode and a filament lamp. Filament lamp is basically the hot a hot example. So, how does the semiconductor diode work? Uh, let me just explain that part. uh i'm going to show you a video and uh, from the youtube uh, let me just find that video and then i'm going to pause the recording because if i just show this to you in my recording youtube youtube gives me copyright infringement acha i'm curious to see youtube e gaya to amader ke doping dekhabo the point integrate the word is a mela word at the word like that Pause the recording. 